Senior Report thanks Edmund Besch of Bristol Burgess Insurance Agency, 65 East Main Street, Westfield, for his generous grant to provide news to seniors. Funding is provided by a grant from New York State Senator Catherine M. Young, representing Western New York's 57th District with a local office in Olean. Funding for Senior Report is provided in part by a grant from Andrew Goodell, Assemblyman for the 150th District of the New York State Assembly. Senior Report with Reed Powers thanks Westfield's Schultz Chevy for a generous grant to inform seniors of important news. Over 50 years of service to Westfield by Chevrolet, Schultz Chevy across from the school. The physicians of Jamestown Primary Care are happy to sponsor the Senior Report. From the Access Channel 5 television studio in Mayville, it's Senior Report with Reed Powers. Senior Report is broadcast live throughout northern Chautauqua County on Saturday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. each week. Call in and share a thought, make a comment, ask a question, or simply wish someone a happy birthday on Chautauqua County's only live call-in senior program. Since 1995, Reed has been bringing viewers hundreds of interesting guests informing the community on a variety of subjects. Here's the host of the show, Reed Powers. Thank you, Kent. That's Kent Knappenberger. Many of you may recognize him. He's a resident of Mayville, but he's been in Westfield for a million years teaching. And he's going to be here to talk a little bit about the goings-on in his life, which are fascinating and uh, important, because he did win the very first educational Grammy ever given out to anybody in the world. And uh, it's a national matter. He beat out everybody in the country, <laughs> which speaks very well for his uh, talent. He's talented in two ways, and we'll talk a little about that as we're going along. Um, I, you as, always. As far as the local news is concerned, of course, there's nothing much on the air now except the Russian uh, invasion of the, uh, the Crimea, <laughs> or the Ukraine, where they are uh, apparently stationing troops all over the place, taking off, trying to take over airports. Uh, uh, they're, uh, it, it's hard to believe in this day and age well, we're trying to get a peaceful coexistence going between Russia and the United States and all the other powers in this world that uh, Putin would dis uh, embark on such a crazy action. Um, uh, at this point, uh, he's got some warship. He has a major warship parked down in Cuba right now <laughs> facing the United States. So <laughs> Lord knows what's going on in his funny little mind. But at any rate, we're hoping this uh, settles down before it becomes... Uh, a serious matter. He's got all his troops uh, that are uh, guarding or uh, have invaded the, uh, the Crimea. Uh, he's got them all in unmarked uniforms, so we don't know whether they're Russian or Polish or French. <laughs> uh, we have our suspicions, I might add. And they tell me I've got to straighten my tie. Well, I don't know about this. I guess that's a little better. <laughs> Hey, the weather's changing. It's going to be nice and warm today, and then it's going back to sub-zero temperatures, I think. But at any rate, maybe your faucet, your uh, pipelines will thaw out today. 
<laughs> I've got, I've got, I haven't got any water in my kitchen, but I do have uh, water elsewhere, so things are okay. And uh, last year I did have a freeze in that darn kitchen, and I should know better. I should leave the water trickling, but I'd forgotten, and it froze up solid last night. And uh, <laughs> it's at this point, uh, you, I don't think until the spring thaw in March or April, come uh, uh, April probably, uh, will I have water in my kitchen. <laughs> And I might have water in my cellar, who knows? At any rate, we're all in the same boat, and uh, life goes on in Westfield, New York, and uh, the rest of Chautauqua County. <laughs> all right, I'm going to uh, play for you a, a very short public service announcement, and then I'm going to, well, they say I better do the senior report first. I have a few uh, items on clubs that I wanted to mention, and then we'll do our public service announcement. The Great Belt Seniors, uh, they say they're continuing regular meetings. They, uh, they have all kinds of wonderful things. They have gin rummy and backgammon and uh, I don't know, hopscotch, who knows what they're playing over there. But they have a very, uh, a, a, a tremendous, vigorous gang of people. And if you, they, they meet in the Mason Hall in Fredonia. If, if anybody's interested, go on over there and just shoulder your way in. <laughs> They'd love to see you. Um, the, uh, the Sheridan Seniors at 1 p.m. are on February 14th, which is long gone, had a great program on. And uh, they talked, uh, Joanne Martin came in and uh, reported on trips coming up. They're going to Salamanca, of course. You know why they're down there, not to see the Indian nation, but to play at the casino. And uh, that's, that's coming up very shortly, March uh, 31st. And uh, they're also going to a Broadway market on April 9th. So uh, get in there and get involved. You know, there's so many senior groups around, there's no excuse for any senior to be lonely. You have all kinds of folks and a, a huge uh, separate family, really, a community of wonderful people uh, to, to get together. I wanted to mention the village of Westfield uh, has uh, some recreation uh, items on. They're having a pancake cake and maple syrup dinner um, and you can get uh, just regular stuff if you want, uh, regular sugar. Um, and they're, uh, I don't know, they're, they're doing a lot of things at the Recreation Department in Westfield. You want to call them and find out what's uh, going on. But that pancake supper is coming up soon, so check that out. Uh, Lakeshore Seniors, next uh, meeting is uh, coming up shortly. They meet every two weeks, three weeks. And Stella Mikulak is the uh, person on the... Uh, Refreshment committee. <laughs> that's the that's the most important part of the meeting. You understand that the coffee and the the the, uh, the punch and the snacks. On February twenty third, uh, the pickle bell will be held at one p.m. in the gymnasium. <laughs> and don't ask me what the pickle bell is. <laughs> oh, they tell me I'm all finished here. Get out of here. I say get out of here, Reed. You're just mumbling on idly about nothing in particular. <laughs> Uh, there isn't a lot of senior report uh, news <laughs> today. I'll give you the public service announcement, and then we're going to talk to John Hamels, Doc Hamels, and he's the one who tells it like it is. Here you go. This is for you. It all comes down to this. To be a winning team, you have to work like a winning team. We have a job to do out here today. Some people think it's about muscle, but it's really about heart. A lot of heart. My team depends on me. And my team is 50,000 strong. Looks like a lot of work is going into this. what it feels like to be part of a team. A winning team. The action team. Get in on the action at actionteam.org. Are you in? Are you in? Okay, John, you're on. <laughs> oh, I'm back. <laughs> Hey, I missed you guys last week. I, I know you did, and we missed you. You Sam didn't even call in. We were, I couldn't. We were I was, heartbroken. 
<laughs> was busy. Busy. You well, have a cell phone. You good morning, just... everybody, and welcome <laughs> to the show, Senior Report. Hey, and good morning, Kent. How are you morning. doing? Good to see you. Wow, we have a great show for you guys today. Hey, Reed, what month is it? What month is it? This is already March already. And you know what that means. When March comes, you get your Irish on, huh? That's right, because the 17th is a very special holy day. Hey, that it is. And, and my kids, uh, who lived on Long Island at the time, that was a day off for them. <laughs> Well, that's because every all the staff were out partying. <laughs> Miles are closed to places it's like it's like deer hunting up this way. It used yeah, to be. right. Well, a lot of kids didn't take, uh, didn't go to school on the seventeenth up in Copenhagen. I, I know. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm I'm part Irish and part Sicilian. So on the seventeenth, uh, everybody would celebrate uh, St. Patrick's Day, and two days later, we had to celebrate St. Joseph's. Well, you could on St. Patty's Day instead of corned so, beef, you could have had spaghetti. You know? <laughs> Oh, well, that was two days later. So anyways, <laughs> it, March is a great month for lots of celebrating. Yeah, sure okay. Is. Well, let's get right to it. Uh, I got a, an announcement, uh, an invitation to everyone that's watching today. Uh, we're just going to pop up with a, ma a magic. There it is. Folks, Ken Knappenberger has been here. He knows all about this. We're going to, uh, Doc and I, Doc, I'm Doc. Bill and I are going to be at the um, 1891 Opera House in Fredonia, and that's on March 14th, and we've got some dancers. I can't even. Clanacara. Thank you, Clanacara. Yeah. Irish dancers, and they're uh, just been there year after year after year. And uh, there's the information. You can go on the website, and you can order tickets, and we'll get them at the door, and so forth. We are really stoked, and it should be a lot of fun. So that's coming up March 14th, and we hope. Yeah, I saw hope that to see picture there. on the front page of the. Jamestown Post Journal. Well, today. I just happen to have that. I'm, oh, you do. Show how people. about that for a segue? <laughs> I never know when I'm going to show up. <laughs> this morning, I, maybe you've already seen it, but uh, tomorrow, this is something a little new for me. <clears throat> There's something at the Lucille Ball Little Theater, and it's called the Kaleidoscope Variety Show. And uh, they're going to have representatives from all the various uh, organizations that promote arts and music and so forth. And uh, it's like a little sampler. And Bill and I are going to be representing the uh, folk series. And Kent knows that very well. We've been together what, a couple years now, Kent, right? Yep. Yeah. So it's a great time. And if you if you haven't seen that uh, at the Opera House, come out. I've, I mention it every year. It's the uh, folk free for all. I guess it's called, and it's a lot of fun. And a bunch of us get together and play some music and have a good time. So, anyways, but. Uh, uh, this is going to be a fun month, lots of things, and we're going to be talking about where we're going to be and stuff like that and uh, uh, and that sort of thing. But, you know, uh, Reed, I was thinking today, since we have Kent here, that I, I, I maybe kick the, the topic off. How's that of music? Well, just shoot. All right. Well, you know, <clears throat> there's, there's this never-ending battle of what's important in life, whether you should learn uh, math or engineering or uh, science or music, arts, and so forth, sports and so forth. And, you know, as a superintendent, that was one of the things we always tried to do is get a good balance so that students, when they left our schools, uh, would w be well equipped, you know, not just in one particular area. But <clears throat> for me personally, music has done a lot. And it didn't have to be just music, but in my case it was music because there's just so many other parts of the arts, dance and, 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 and uh, artwork and painting and stuff like that. But uh, for me, it started at a, a ripe age of 10 years old. I don't know if I ever told you this. This is like secrets that I've had all these what's years. A, what's a secret? You, you, 10 years old, I, was, I auditioned for an all-boys choir at our church, and I flunked my first test because oh, no. I was just so nervous. I know this seems hard to believe, but I was a very shy kid at, when I was 10 years old. No, I don't believe <clears throat> All my friends made it into the choir, and I knew I could sing better than they could. So I went back for a second audition, got accepted, and ended up actually being the, uh, they actually called us a captain of the choir. And I sang first soprano, and then when I got older, I got down to second soprano, and then eventually down to a, 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 a baritone, baritone bass, I think I am now. So anyways, but just thinking about my career in music, you know, which was always an avocation rather than what paid the bills, um, the things that I learned a lot were discipline, just practice and listening and paying attention and not goofing off. And I know that that's made a big difference. Practice. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? I'm working on it. I got to the Opera House. Carnegie Hall is next. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the answer is practice. Practice, practice. practice. <laughs> 
What, and then going down my list here of cooperation and teamwork, you know, we don't think of that when we think of music. You always think of just one guy doing it. But if you play in a group or even a duo like I do, there's negotiation, there's discussion, there's cooperation. Uh, who's going to do what? And then practice, practice, practice. Timing. You know, you, we talk about timing as, you know, three-quarter time or whatever, but it's also timing in life. Knowing when to open your mouth, when to shut it, when to jump in, when not to jump in. And so timing is something that kind of fills our lives in knowing what good timing is all about. Uh, in my particular case, uh, in the last few years, because I haven't done Irish music all my life or folk music, but my heritage, I have gone back to my roots in Ireland, and, I've been, and as you all know, I've been to Ireland, I've sat in with an Irish group and learned the music over there. And what a great opportunity music brings for us. Confidence. Uh, like I said, I, if you would have told me years ago that I'd be sitting in front of a television uh, camera like I am or getting in, up in front of thousands of people and singing, I would have said, you are crazy. <laughs> but that's what music does for you. And finally, appreciation for things like hard work and appreciating when somebody does something. It doesn't even have to be music necessarily, but something that's really complicated or intricate when you know that you've tried to do this or you watch another uh, guitarist or musician or a singer uh, you go wow you really have an appreciation where normally you would have just blown it off i have appreciation for genius and ladies and gentlemen we've got that here today kent nap and burgers here okay before you go away genius. i've got a comment on your uh on my your, your comments okay <laughs> sure well uh, you've got to help me with this all right i'll help you okay out. you've got to uh, you asked me two questions you say, uh, who are you? That's your first question. And then right. you say, what's the secret of your success, okay? Secret of my success? No, you asked that question. Oh, that's your second question. That's my second question. You're right. going to address me. All right. Okay, uh, go Oh, ahead. I'm going to ask you, hey, what's your secret, Reed? Well, well first of all, you've got to say, who are you? Who are you, Reed? I'm uh, the uh, world's greatest Irish comedian. And? <laughs> I'm, we don't have canned applause here. <laughs> what is the secret of your success? What is the secret of your success? Okay, you got your lines right now? I'm ready. Okay, let's go. Okay, so who are you? I'm the world's greatest Irish comedian. So Reed, what's Timing. this? Timing. So what's the secret of your success? Timing. <laughs> Timing, okay. <laughs> to the moon. <laughs> All right. Back to you, and we can't wait to hear from Ken. <laughs> All right, we're on. Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot. You're most welcome. <laughs> Ken, come on over here, will you, so they can get both of us in the, in the same shot. The closer, the better. I won't touch you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ken Appenberger uh, uh, needs a little uh, introduction because he's been in the news uh, almost ubiquitously lately. I mean, every time you turn around, you get a shot, you get a lot of ink in the papers, and for good reason. And it's for that little thing right there. What is that? Uh, you want to fish that over here? Sure. There it is. This is the uh, this is the award that I won in California. That's the Grammy. Yep. You had to go to California to get it. Yeah, that was okay though. <laughs> I, I didn't mind. You didn't mind. It was pretty nice there. Probably. <laughs> hey, you're scalping them. <laughs> it's wonderful there. Okay. Good shot. Good shot. Thanks. This is a so-called Grammy, and it's the first one ever given out. They tell me for education, right? That's right. And uh, what do you do to? Well, I know you uh, have. A, I know you by personally a little bit and by uh, re uh, your uh, reputation in Westfield. Um, they tell me you have two great um, talents. One is you uh, can you seem to uh, relate well to the children. They called, uh, one person said he's a Pied Piper. The kids follow you wherever, they, they, uh -oh. whatever you do. And secondly, of course, uh, you're a fabulous musician in your own right. Do um, you ever do any performances or anything? Yeah, I do. I actually most recently I played with my family. Um, we have three daughters at home that are very musical, and my wife is also a musician. And like Doc said a couple minutes ago, we have done the folk free for all in Fredonia. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then in December, they asked us to be part of a new winter concert series that we did, and you know the five of us uh, did a short program. It was a lot of fun. What are the kids? What do they play or do? Well, they sing probably. Yeah, they all sing. Uh, my wife sings, mm -hmm. and my daughter Lucy plays the Irish low whistle, and I have one of those today I brought along. Oh, good. And she plays guitar, and our daughter Esther plays the penny whistle, mm -hmm. which is a smaller version of that. The Irish and, penny whistle. Yep. And our daughter and Esther also sings, and our daughter Amanda plays the flute. And what's your wife do? She sings. She sings. Uh -huh. What's her name? Nanette. Nanette, okay. 
Um, we have a uh, tremendous amount of publicity over this because this was a national award, right? Yes. No one else in the, you, you had to compete against 100 million uh, teachers, I guess. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of yeah. teachers. And uh, what, what do you figure uh, is your success? Uh, what is the uh, basis for your winning? Well, if I were to think about that myself, you know, as far as why, why they picked me. Yeah. Um, well, I can never really be 100% sure. But if I had to guess, you know, our school is not that big. Westfield's not a huge school, but I think we've been good, not just in what we do at music, but what we do everywhere, in kind of saying, so we're a rural school. What can a rural school do in providing a great education for a kid? And one of the things that we do is it's, I like to think we attend to the needs of the whole child, and we also attend to different uh, kids' learning needs across the board. Mm -hmm. And in terms of what our music program does to do that, we have a choir and we have a band that are kind of traditional as far as how music is taught in school. But we also have a thing called the general music class mm -hmm. where kids have experiences in performing, singing, songwriting. And mm -hmm. those classes are just open to anybody really who wants to take them. I would say generally speaking, in a given year, we'd have about 25% of our students would be taking those in high school, and, and mm -hmm. about 100%, I would say, in the rest of the school. Uh -huh. And um, that's where we put kids together in situations that are musical, of course, yeah. where uh, you, really, you really have to interact with a broad group of kids. They're not auditioned to be in these classes. Anybody who wants to take them Just can sign up. Just walk in and sit down, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, the percentage of kids that are involved, what we accomplish in class, their musical skills that, w that they have, those are all pretty unique. And it's, the, the big thing is it's not just centered around being in a performing ensemble. So it's not entirely about you know, just being in the choir. There is a whole bunch of other musical learning that we do. And uh, that's, we don't just get attention you know, from the Grammys for that. We get, have gotten attention from the New York State School Music Association, the National Association for Music Education. You won other awards. Uh, yeah, the, well, the kids have. Yeah, the kids have gotten quite a bit of recognition. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So you would say that the Westfield School, uh, the school board and the district, the supervisor and everything, have a lot to do with it because they emphasize the arts. Well, I wouldn't say just that they emphasize the arts, but they really emphasize kids. And uh, no matter who my administrator has been for the last 25 years, because this is my 25th year that I've been there. You run through a few of them. Yeah, just a, just a couple. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we'll go into that. But uh, over that time, the kids have really been a priority. And, you know, one of my things that I believe is that, you know, if we study the arts, we're not just doing it for the sake of, um, just what the arts teach us or just how they interact with other subject areas but really what does this do for the human being that's studying it and that's where i think we've seen a lot of results in terms of kids school experience and even into their adult lives which is really the bottom line and because of that um what we do there in terms of my subject area but also many others is really very kid centered and we have kids that are extremely successful at adults and pretty much whatever they would like to learn or whatever they would like to do I see our I see our graduates doing that I see our young people leaving our school and going off to lives like that yeah well I'm an example of that I'm a graduate of Westfield Academy and Central School and uh, my main goals in life I've fulfilled and that is to be kind of laid back and sit in front of the camera and pretend I'm somebody important <laughs> and uh, make no money <laughs> <laughs> I've been very successful at this. <laughs> Fortunately, I, I was married to a beautiful woman and married to a lovely woman, and I have three beautiful children. And Westfield is absolutely a, a, a little, the little Garden of Eden in Chautauqua County, as far as I'm concerned. Well, know? that makes two of us to think that at least. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, few people realize that Westfield was part of the, the Portage Road, which is very important once upon a time because they could ship anything down the lakes, the Great Lakes, to Westfield, and then they could portage it over the hill with mules or whatever they wanted mm -hmm. to do. They couldn't go upstream. 
uh, and uh, they could uh, take their stuff down Chautauqua Lake to the end of it and then down the, the, through the, de the gates and down through the Ohio River into the Mississippi and they'd be all anywhere they wanted to go really in the country. Yeah. And this was a very important place, uh, Westfield uh, at the time. As a matter of fact, folks, I bet you don't know unless you're a diver, there is a uh, about a fifth of a mile pier that goes out from Barcelona. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's buried because it's underwater and it's all falling apart, but you can follow the rocks. And uh, it was a, a, quite a place. They called it the Crossroads. Mm -hmm. Back then, Westfield was named Crossroads. And that's because that's where the continental stuff crossed over into the rest of the country. And uh, it's still a beautiful place to live. As a matter of fact, the French were uh, in their anthologies when they were going through there. They said, this is, uh, this is the Garden of Eden. It's beautiful here. Yeah. They loved it. You are fortunate in that um, you live in the area. Chautauqua County is gorgeous. You have been nurtured. You lived here since you were a little kid, uh, right? Since I was nine. Nine years old. And do uh, you plan to be buried here? Or are you going to move, move to, <laughs> move, are you gonna move to Florida? I was just thinking about that. No, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how that works out. Yeah, you can't tell right yet. Huh? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I tell you, it's a, it's a, we're fortunate. And your accomplishments in the world of music are just outstanding. Now, you said you would play a little piece for us. Would you do Sure, that? be happy to. Okay, great. Watch, watch your, uh, well, your little mic there. This is a Celtic harp that I brought with me. So this Celtic is Celtic harp. What's yeah, the difference is, between that well, and any I, other harp? I can explain that. It, if you look at the harps that are in like an orchestra or something, they would be probably around six foot tall and they have a set of pedals that connect to rods that run up through the pillar in the harp and they're, they're quite complicated. Anyway, uh, the and harps heavy. That, they're heavy. Yeah, they weigh about 80 pounds. This kind of harp is, is how harps began. You know, this is a very ancient instrument. It goes back thousands of years. And this instrument, or I call it a Celtic harp, it's kind of a contemporary design. It was made by a guy in his garage in West Virginia. And I bought it so I could have an instrument I could take out and play. So when I talk about performing with my wife and my daughters, this is generally the instrument that I use. So the song I've got to play, sort of timely, Happy March, is um, Irish. And it's called Shula Rune, and it's, a, it's kind of a love song. Okay, what Shula Rune mean? Um, I think the chickens are laying eggs. Honey, go <laughs> gather me a dozen. I'm sure it is. <laughs> Ken Nappenberger. Uh, playing a little uh, tune for us on his uh, harp, and it's, this is the Celtic harp. Thank you very much, Kent. You're welcome. Beautiful piece. Um, it shows that art is important. Uh, you know, we have, our schools are criticized in many cases because they teach you to make a living. They're teaching you to make a living instead of giving you real learning. But that's where the art comes in. The art is the opposite pole. It's teaching you to improve your life, it's giving you something special that's different from learning. You're probably not going to make money out of it, 
It's, it's not teaching you to mechanically do something, although it could teach you to play the harp, I guess. <laughs> but the, uh, Go to Westfield. Yeah. And do they teach harp in Westfield? We do. We have three <laughs> Celtic harps that are much uh -huh. smaller than this. They're about this high. But then we recently had a donor, uh, since they saw the publicity of the Grammy Award on, uh -huh. on TV, yeah. saw that we taught Celtic harp there. So this individual from Lockport, New York, called me up and said, or sent me an email rather, and said, hey, I have a Celtic harp that I don't use. Do you think the school could use it? And it is a beautiful instrument. The kids are thrilled to have it. And it's, it's very valuable. And we're going to take good care of it and put it to good use. It's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a bare-bones harp. It doesn't, as you say, have all those. Well, this one is made by the Salvi Harp Company in Italy, the uh -huh. one that we were donated. And it's a little more than a, than a bare-bones harp. It's, it's a nice oh, yeah. instrument. We can do quite a bit with it. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you know, in terms of what you were saying about, uh, you know, music in the schools and, yeah. and why, we, why we teach what we do, I think, and I'm speaking about the arts in general, it's something that really exists in every culture on planet Earth. And I think it's, you know, it's because of the arts that we end up kind of defining ourselves. Yeah. And we define not just who we are as cultures, but we define ourselves as individuals. You know, I think life's tough. And we expect kids to leave without what I'm going to call a very natural tool that's part of living. And, and this, this has kind of led to a lot of how we decide what we teach in terms of music in our school. Mm -hmm. And it's not really about, you know, so you can go out and get a, a living as a professional musician. Well, no. But it is about how that relates to you being a human being. And I would say that's true in, in music and visual arts and... And even in how we, you know, why do we read literature? You know, is that so we can become, you know, versed in Shakespeare? Well, yes and no. I mean, it's, it's a combination. Why do, we, why do we listen to Beethoven or, or sing Mozart? Because somehow through doing those things, we kind of figure out who we are and where we fit in the world. That's you my sermon on that. You, well, that's a good uh, grip. Um, you did mention Beethoven and uh, the, uh, some of the, the greats, the giants of uh, classical music. What do you think of pop music? Well, I think it's like any music that's been written brand new for the last however many years people have been doing uh -huh. that, that there's some that you know we hear today and, and there's not a lot of information in it, so you might not want to listen to it again in 10 years except for nostalgia purpose. And there's other music that's being written that's even, you know, that we would call pop that has a lot to it and maybe, you know, several years down the road we'll still be listening to it and thinking, wow, there's a lot, there's a lot to this. It's, it's kind of like how music's always been, I believe. Uh -huh. Yeah, rap is included in that, of course. And rap, yeah. rap music tends to send a message, although there's an old saying in the ar world of the arts, if you have a message to send, use Western Union. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't use your art. Uh, and when we speak of art, we speak of the dance, we speak of uh, painting, sculpture, um, of course, music, and anything involved in that uh, that doesn't make money. We got a couple of phone calls. You want to take a phone call? Sure. I'm okay. sitting down. We're on. Good morning, caller. Good morning. Enjoying the show immensely. Well done. I have a question, if I may, for your guest. Sure. Mr. Knappenberger, you haven't shared the excitement of being with um, the musical greats in California. Could you share, especially Ringo Starr and all those others? <laughs> well, that, that was a really exciting thing. And the way the Grammys are given out, there are actually two, three events. There is the event we see on TV, which is called the telecast. And then before the telecast, they give out about 55 other Grammys in what they call the pre-telecast, which is held literally across the street in Los Angeles at the, at the Nokia Center. And then the day before, on Saturday, at the Wilshire Abel Theater, they have what's called the Special Merit Ceremony. So the Grammy that I got was actually given out there. And at that ceremony, there were people receiving Lifetime Achievement Awards and Grammys for like technical production, for example. And at that event, uh, the Beatles were receiving a Lifetime Achievement uh, Grammy. Mm. So Ringo Starr was there and Yoko Ono and uh, Olivia Harrison were there. And boy, was that exciting. And I then, bet that was fun. Yeah, I mean, it did was. Did you have a chance to actually talk to them? I did. And I was, I got a, the award that I got was, mm -hmm. was given out first. And that day I was allowed to make a speech, or asked to make a speech, however you want to put it. <laughs> and it was three or four minutes long, so, you know, it's kind of crazy to think, I'm going to be addressing an audience with Ringo Starr in it, and a whole host of other very talented musicians, members of the Recording Academy, so it was a little intimidating to do that. Nonetheless, you know, I, I got up and did it, and it's funny because, you know, I used to teach middle school especially. Uh, when well, I was teaching middle school, I should say, I'd look out in a class and there'd be the kid who was looking at you like this, and then there's the kid who's like, 
you know, tuned out. So I'm looking at both those kind of kids all the time. You know, trying to get the kid who's not engaged to be engaged and also enjoying the fact that I got, you know, other kids who are already into what's going on. So I look out in the theater and I'd be speaking, you know, to essentially a darkened theater because the lights were in my face. But I looked down in the front row, there was Ringo Starr. And I'd be talking and I'd look at Ringo. And I'd be talking and then I'd look at Ringo again because he kept looking <laughs> up. And what, so I, he was very attentive. But uh, that was kind of cool. And I thought, good grief, I'm addressing Ringo Starr, the importance of music in our lives. But um, he was very nice about it afterwards. And, you know, there was a group picture of everybody that received the Grammy that day. And he came up and, and uh, you know, told me what he thought, which was, were nice words. And a photographer who had been with us all week at different events said, hey, can I get you guys together for a picture? And I thought, oh, boy, you know, this is really cool. <laughs> so he, did, he took a picture of Ringo and I. And uh, it's kind of nice to have that. And, you know, there were a lot of people that I got to meet. But the ones who really stand out in my mind uh, are, are a crazy mix of people, and he's one of them. Another one would be the composer Paul Williams. And if you don't know who he is, he wrote the theme for The Love Boat and The Rainbow Connection, and we've only just begun to name a few. And uh, he had some really neat things to say about why he thought music was important to our kids and his support of what the Grammy Foundation tries to do. Another person was this producer named Jimmy Jam. And he's the producer of Janet Jackson, among others. But probably my favorite conversation with a pers person in the industry that really wants to support like the mission of the Grammy Foundation was, was with him. That was, that was really cool. OK, so, you, so that was the experience. Oh, yeah. Collar? Did you get, did you get their autograph? Did you get Ringo's autograph? <laughs> no, I didn't. And I, you know, I, I don't want to sound like I'm a shy person. But I just didn't have it in me to say, hey, could I have your autograph? Plus, it was pretty crazy right at that moment because there were all kinds of photographers around and people were getting their pictures taken. So I was just glad I got a picture with him and he was kind enough to share some words with me. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Collar. If you'll send in a, uh, a, a large postpaid box and self-addressed box, we'll send you a harp. <laughs> oh. oh, nice. <laughs> a little harp. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, so, I don't know. Why is it that whenever the school board is uh, trying to cut the budget, which they're constantly doing these days, needless to say, because they're cutting uh, school funding all over the place, and uh, it's breaking the, the backs of the local taxpayer to have to pay so much money. <clears throat> Why is it that the first thing they do is cut the arts? Well, right now there's a big, you know, educational reform is something that's constantly going on. And it should constantly be going on because we learn more every day about how the brain works and how adolescents learn. And we should really be pretty smart about that by now. But as we learn that the, there's, or as we uh, continue in educational reform, there's a big emphasis on testing right now. And music is not really part of an area that's being directly tested. And that's probably okay. But the, the thing that's not okay is we're very focused on what the test number is. And because of that, a lot of our, the funds, and you know, education's under the, under the gun right now, are kind of get funneled to areas that are going to impact test results. However, it ends up being a question of, is there a way that we can still do what we do and maybe even do it better if we change how we deliver? And I, I don't mean that in the sense of just how we deliver music education, but I mean that in the sense of how we deliver any education. I mean, we have all this technology now. We're supposed to supposedly know all this stuff about how kids learn. Um, there are a lot of resources available to us. So if funds are in tough shape, which I don't know when that's going to end, and I wish I could say it would end tomorrow, it's really... It's causing us to be creative in how, how we solve some problems. Unfortunately, how some districts solve that problem is to say, well, let's, you know, let's get rid of the arts. Things we don't need. Yeah. <laughs> I Which, like the arts. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that I work <laughs> in a school that isn't like that. Uh -huh. But I, we try to, and I, not just music, but also visual art. And anytime arts are really dealt with in our school, I think we have a, a strong case for how we involve that in the lives, the total education of the kid, and also their total experience as, as a human being and in, in our school. Testing, testing. How do they test for arts? Uh, it, it, uh, you have a certain amount of background and experience and take a certain amount of joy in music, uh, painting, sculpture, whatever it might be. How do they test this? Well, you know, as a teacher, I have to assess kids all the time. And sometimes it's in very easy areas, like if, we're, if I'm teaching music theory, there are things that we have covered that are, you know, as real skills and knowledge, or even in terms of how, if we play an instrument. So 
I really try to stay away from, you know, I'm going to give a kid, actually I stay away completely from, I'm going to give a kid uh, a, a random grade, let's say, on an attitude yeah, or Yeah, how do you grade it even? That's another, another tough one. Well, for example, like in choir, there, I have over 100 kids, I have to see it once. So they get graded on five different things, all of which, to be perfectly honest, are visual. And one of them is how do, how do they produce vowels when they sing? And that has a lot to do with how your mouth is shaped. So yeah. I see that I can see that from what I'm conducting, and mm -hmm. I can pick five kids at rehearsal and say, okay, I'm focusing on this row today. I'm going to see how they do with their posture, which affects breathing. I mean, there really are some things. I, I was asked by a colleague of mine, innocently enough, you know, do you even have a curriculum in music? And yeah, we do. The thing is, um, it's just not widely known <laughs> to people how how we would do that. But mm -hmm. there, you know, there's all kinds of criteria we use when we evaluate kids. So no, that's kind of how things work in my world, but that's that's true in any subject area. You know, it's, uh, any, uh, I, I took education, a lot of education courses uh, when I was in college, and uh, I'm absolutely convinced today that they uh, grade you just on the expression on your face. If you look real enthusiastic, you get an A. If you look like you're well, going to puke, you get a D. <laughs> that's about all I have. <laughs> I, that's partly in jest, I might add. Famous Emmy winners. Who else uh, who, that we would recognize has won an Emmy? N nobody's won that Emmy, but you. But oh uh. uh, well, this year uh, at the pre-telecast, Maria Schneider, who's a person who spends time in our area every summer, is a composer, oh. and that may, name might be familiar to people. But she won uh, a Grammy Award for one of her compositions. Actually, I think she was. We got your picture of Ringo Starr. Do you want to want to shoot? Okay, he says good. There you go. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> I don't know how tall Ringo is, but <laughs> but he's a nice guy. So that was sweet of him. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> we interrupted you. That's all right. Um, there, uh, see the ones that stand out in my mind might not be as well known to everybody. There's a classical a cappella group from Massachusetts called Roomful of Teeth that got a Grammy. I thought was great. But I mean, they're the ones that are on TV. Um, at the ceremony I was at, the Isley Brothers, who originally recorded the song "Twist and Shout." which ironically was the same ceremony that where the Beatles got their award, and of course they both recorded that song, but they got their Grammy that day. A group called Craftwork, and I remember as a kid at Mayville Lakeside Park hearing this song called The Autobahn that was recorded by Craftwork at that time. They got a, a, a Grammy that day. That was in 1970, like mm. five or something. So an awful lot of uh, big people who are big heat in the world of... Uh, well, it's a big variety, too. Yeah. I mean, people who are in sound production or designing technology that affects the recording industry. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, a music educator, which I, for which I'm very grateful. Yeah, well, I th I'm glad that they um, accepted the fact that the educator is very, very important, even though well, he might not be a great musician. You don't necessarily have to be uh, a, a great artist to be an educator. And this came from the New York chapter of the Recording Academy, which is kind of cool, because the first, you know, because I'm from New York, and they're the ones who said, hey, you know, we should really be doing this. Yeah. And it's nice to think that private industry of any kind can support education of any kind. It just so happens that private industry for music, a big spokesperson is the Recording Academy and the Grammy Foundation, so. And they're the ones who upped it, huh? Well, they are, and it's nice, you know, I think, well, it's nice that an organization like that kind of has my back in a way. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, really believe that this is an encouragement to others. You know, it's, it's not about me. It's about all kinds of music teachers out there. And the fact that, you know, the 32,000 people got nominated, that means that there are 32,000 music teachers in the United States that somebody thinks is exceptional. And that, that's kind of amazing and wonderful to me. I mean, what, I'm proud to be part of that. Sure. And the first one. <laughs> that's, uh, they never can take that away. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> the first. I haven't quite wrapped my brain around that yet. Yeah, I know. It it's must be uh, fabulous. Um, I'll bet you'll watch next year, too, to see who gets it. <laughs> I, I hope I can. I'd love to. Uh, I'll, do they give it to the same person more than once? Uh, I, I, there's never been that discussion. I certainly uh, am not going to proceed with any part no, no, of the I process mean, myself. For any category. Oh, yeah. Be. Yeah. There, I met a recording engineer when I was at a, an event at Capitol Records uh -huh. that had won like 26 Grammys or something. No kidding. Yeah, his house <laughs> must just have a room for them. Uh -huh. <laughs> he must be a pretty hot recording engineer, too. Yeah, he must be good at his business, yeah. whatever, whatever it might be. Um, what's the school say to you about this? Uh, it's really been exciting to be a school. First off, uh -huh. they've been very supportive, uh -huh. and, and kids are very excited. And I work with some absolutely exceptional colleagues. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there's a lot of ways that people could react to this. And the way that has been communicated to me is, 
you know, support. We're glad that our school gets to be, you know, recognized because it's really, you know, I, c I could have talked to an empty room about my great ideas about, you know, teaching music. It wouldn't have mattered. But the fact is I work with great kids in a town that I li I'm very proud to be part of and I have great colleagues and, and I really feel all that right now. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an awesome, we, Westfield School is an awesome place. And you've extended your family to, uh, uh, you have uh, adopted eight children, right? We over have. Over the years, which is quite a gift, really, when a child needs a place to live, to reach out and give them your heart, which is your home. Uh, it must be very satisfying. It is. And we also have a biological daughter, so we have nine total. But there are three at home, and <laughs> they're, uh -huh. they're awesome. Our daughter just got accepted to, to two different colleges. She's getting ready to head off next year, and we're, we're very excited for her. And you know, when you're talking about family, I got to mention too. My brother just won a master teacher award for teaching science at our school, and he's two years younger than me. And we've worked together for a number of years. And oh, uh, he's in Westfield too. Yeah, what's, what's his name? His name's Lon, and he won uh, from the, got a citation from the governor, and it's mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a pretty cool thing because he does really crazy, wonderful stuff in science. Well, it's a. Uh, I must say, is there's something, there's a gene there. <laughs> Much people. Well, can, <laughs> you can blame my parents or thank them, one or the other. <laughs> uh, well, uh, what, uh, did Nanette go out with you? Yes, yeah, she did, and also our three daughters that are still at home. Oh, they and did. they'll never forget that. We, we walked several, three red carpets, and that's kind of an experience to be in front of a bunch of cameras, you know, going off in your face. But Did they meet Ringo? Yeah, actually, Esther, uh, our eight-year-old, had just ah. gotten through the red carpet, and we were standing in the, there at the end kind of thinking, okay, what do we do now? And Ringo walked through and patted her on her head and said, hey, kiddo. I said, Esther, never wash your hair again. You know? <laughs> but uh, that was kind of neat. And they met some other people, too. They met Paul Williams. My, Esther knows Paul Williams is the guy who wrote Kermit the Frog's song for the Muppet movie. Oh, no kidding. So she had fallen asleep during a concert when we heard him. And when she woke up, then asked, my wife said, oh, Esther, we're, we're sad you didn't get to, to meet the guy who wrote Kermit's song. And Esther was distressed about this. Uh -huh. But then we were at the Staples Arena the day of the telecast. Who's eating his uh, snack? You know, they had uh, lunch and snacks available for people before the telecast. Who's mm -hmm. standing next to us but Paul Williams? So yeah. not only did she get to, you know, see him, she got to meet him. And he, he called her by name. So that was kind of uh -huh. cool for her. That's great. Uh it's, it's experiences like this are just uh, incomprehensible. You don't know how they're going to affect children, really. <laughs> no, and we, you know, we really wanted our girls to be there, mm -hmm. and hopefully they'll remember this for a long, long time. And they were just, they were just awesome to have in California mm -hmm. with us. Yeah. Wouldn't have wanted them anywhere else. Yeah. So if you were to uh, use your celebrity and your uh, knowledge, what would you do to adjust or change? the music programs in the general school scenario, not Westfield, but generally. All right, well, <laughs> it just sounds like sure I got, got a couple lot, of agendas. Lot to say. <laughs> well, one is, uh, sometimes I hear about music programs yeah. where, where kids get, like Doc saying, he had to audition for this choir when he was you know, a little boy. Well, you know what, we're all works in progress in terms of being kids, and, or kids growing up. And what if you know, the math teacher said to you in, in, when you were nine, you know what, we had you do some math problems, you didn't really do that great, so I don't think math's for you. Like, what the heck? That, that, that makes me crazy when I hear people give similar stories about music. Well, my teacher told me to stay in the back row and just move my mouth, you know, not to sing. And if we're going to be serious about teaching, we, sh we need to teach everybody. Now, that might mean that the concerts that we do aren't going to be as wonderful, but it's not about a wonderful concert. It's about what kids are learning. Mm -hmm. And that would be my suggestion to anybody. And uh, I do have another platform, and it's this, that rural schools can do a great job. And I think sometimes we think, oh, if we were just like suburbia, or if we just had this resource or that. But you know, the best resource we have is the fact that we are small communities with a sense of community mm -hmm. that invest, that really invest in our kids. Yeah, and well, I'm so proud that, you know, that's yeah. where I work. I, I, I'll tell that yeah, to well, anybody. Yeah, Westfield, as you say, is a small rural community. I think the, uh, we're just around 5,000 in the mm -hmm. whole township of Westfield, which is the only, there's only one village in the town of Westfield, and that's the village of Westfield, yeah. <laughs> which is interesting. So you have two different governments <laughs> operating the same village. But at any rate, my grandfather says there are, uh, there are actually only uh, 4,992 uh, residents. We lost eight boys in the Civil War and never made them up. Oh. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> this is an old saying that for every pregnant woman, somebody leaves, a male leaves town. 
So we have a population. Hadn't heard that. We have a static population. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, friends, please. <laughs> uh, so at any rate, you're uh, basically ensconced in the, in the uh, celebration, uh, the, uh, the Hall of Fame, really, for teachers. Uh, where do you keep that thing now? Do you keep it under your pillow? Or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been getting a few miles on it lately, and I really, I, I have yet to bring it to school. Cause I really like elementary teachers or elementary kids. Well, teachers come uh -huh. back too, but I need to contact the teachers so if their kids want to see it, because I think it'd be kind of cool to say, "Wow, I got to you know put my hands on a Grammy when I take it home." Yeah, you know, I'll clean right. it up again. Uh -huh. But um, it lives in our dining room in our china closet sometimes uh -huh. but uh -huh. i just won't want it to be anywhere i'm going to spill something on it or blow my nose and you know, have something hit it whatever <laughs> you're not going to defile it in any way right <laughs> no i'm going to try not to so yeah well it is it's actually not only uh, important in its meaning but it's a beautiful uh, a very beautiful uh, little piece that they gave well it. and i hate to philosophize too much here but i when i found out that they had changed the design i thought oh i mean i'm not going to get one of those gramophones and then the designer said, yeah, but you got to realize that there's only one of these. And I thought it was neat, too, that the, the way they designed it is the, the Grammy medal is the negative space around the gramophone. And I thought, you know, isn't that where the teacher is? You know, we're kind of hovering around the outside while this thing is, mm -hmm. you know, the, and that, that was the whole point of the Grammy Foundation doing this. We have all these artists who know something and learn something, became something because of some adult, sometimes a teacher, that had, a, had an impact in their lives. So I thought, well, that, that's pretty cool. I, I'm about that now, so. Yeah, well, it's, you're, you're in a, a very small select crowd now. Um, I hope you do have a whole shelf of them someday. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to get writing some music and join a band or something. Well, I'll start writing some music. When rap. you're uh, 5,000 community, uh, you're not going to uh, compete too well against uh, the big cities where there are millions. So, so it's a, a most a miracle, really. Well, you know, there are things that that our school has been recognized, like I said, in New York State and even in the Northeast. Our, we have a, a string band that plays traditional music, some of it from the 1800s, mm -hmm. that is you know, active in our local historical society. But they got asked to perform as the only ensemble from a public school in New York State at the Northeastern United States Music Conference last year in Hartford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a crazy thing because that means out of well, I mean, every suburban school, every good choir, every good band, every good orchestra, they picked us. And uh, kid, kids are really proud about that. And really, I say us, I mean, I mean like a lot of kids here. There were like 40 kids that went to that. And um, you know, there, there are things that we that have that have happened in Westfield that I'm very proud to be part of. But uh, you know, they are kind of miraculous, and I don't know how this happened. You know, the, I had to answer questions about how it impacted the field of music education. And that was kind of crazy to think about. But, you know, there are some people that are active in, in a global sense of music ed that know what we do here in town and uh, have kind of gotten the word out about what happens. So uh -huh. Uh -huh. we, we kind of had some, some, uh, some stories and background to share when it came to that. Have you started a book? You're going to write a book? Uh, no one would believe it if I did. So. <laughs> well, you didn't have to tell any of your inside <laughs> You like the truth? <laughs> I don't know. You don't have to tell the truth, right? <laughs> Who does when they write a book anyway? That's all I hear. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Nappen Nappenberger, uh, who is a Grammy winner, has won the very first education Grammy. Is it music education or just education? It is called the Grammy Music Educator Award. Okay, so it's music education. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a, we're very proud of him in Westfield. Uh, I want to say that Westfield School District, having gone through it from uh, first grade on, uh, is outstanding. I'm, I'm very impressed with the Westfield education, uh, all in all. And having been there all the way through, it uh, prepared me very well for life and for college. I'm glad to hear you. I think there's a long tradition of that there. Yeah. Well, my father graduated from there. My grandfather went, uh, it was in the area. So I have a long uh, history of Westfield Academy and Central School. All my kids uh, at one point or the other were in Westfield. And um, I'll tell you something, I, I, my grandchildren will probably go there. All right, bring them on. <laughs> bring them on. You'll still be there, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I, got a few, I hope I have a few good years left of me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Well, you teach, uh, what's, what, what range do you teach now? I teach 6th grade through 12th grade. Okay. And, uh, 6th grade through 12th grade, mm -hmm. a lot of singers, and then I do uh, the high school general music classes that I talked about. Yeah, I did a little teaching, and I uh, wound up in the middle school, uh, which is a junior high situation. 
It was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm absolutely yeah, a lot of fun. I'm I'm convinced that uh, the children in that age uh, age of the area are uh, temporarily insane. Well, I could call it that. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, as a teacher, I feel sort of temporarily insane. Well, that's another them. point. Uh, if you stay in the middle school for long enough, you you get you get a little strange and odd, and you become a little temporarily insane too to sort of fit in. And if you don't, <laughs> you get out. And so I I got out. Uh, and uh, a number of my friends tell me it wasn't quick enough, though. <laughs> well, yeah, I remember when I thought a lot of my middle school, I'd get home and think, boy, I really, I probably should just find some adults I should talk to now, because yeah. I'm, I'm having a hard time. <laughs> well, uh, the middle school is a unique situation, I must say, and I, my, uh, my, uh, I, I just got to say, I certainly feel there, there's nothing, nothing like the people that do it year after year after year, because it is a... I think there's more stress in dealing with this age level than there is in dealing with third graders, you know? Well, I, 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 couldn't, yeah, I couldn't speak to that exactly, but I can <laughs> say that I know the kids are deciding a lot of things about themselves when they're in middle school, and a lot goes on there that maybe we don't even see. Okay. You make costumes, right? Me? Somebody tell me you make the costumes for the kids. Nope. No? Okay. That's <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, who makes them? Uh, we have a person actually, Karen Cockrum, who does costumes for our, our shows. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and uh, that's a pretty expensive operation too, the costumes. Well, we uh, we make use of the Salvation Army and what people have Terrific. in their closets sometimes, and <laughs> try to Terrific. try to do that on, our, on a on a very tight budget. Uh, I bet you do. Uh, oh, you know, I bet I bet I know what she's talking about. <laughs> we have a sheep farm. Uh, you have a what? We have a sheep farm, and when our what, what, what do you mean a sheep farm? Well, you know, my other life is I, I run a farm. So I have. So you're a shepherd? Uh, in, of sorts. And uh, I have uh, <laughs> also some dairy cows and we have some uh -huh. horses. So I, I bet this, uh, the, as far as costumes are concerned, when our string band plays, we have a whole, like, closets full of sweaters that are made out of our sheep's wool, like this one I'm wearing. Oh. <laughs> so uh, kids wear those. So that, that probably uh, is, is what person is Where's the sheep that. farm? It's on Fish Road. We actually live in the town of Portland, but we uh -huh. have a Westfield address. How many sheep do you have? Uh, I, when I left the house, there, or not the house, when I left the barn this morning, there were 10. But this is lambing season, so, so there, things can change awful quickly. <laughs> so. Not Christmas, like they have in the, in the Bible. No, the, <laughs> February. The, the little lambs. <laughs> well, we had, we had nice weather two weeks ago, but the sheep don't really recognize that. If it's going to be zero degrees, I think uh -huh. they think, hey, let's have, a, let's have some lambs today. No kidding. And do you eat them? Yes, we do. <laughs> Some of them. And we sell top. wool. You know, we have, we have tons of wool at our house. Who shears them? I do. Do you? Mm-hmm. Well, I see it's, it's a wrestling match to share sheep. <laughs> well, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it, and hopefully I'm doing it the right way and that I win in the end. Uh-huh. Well, I think that's fantastic. What else do you raise besides sheep? We have some dairy cows. Um, uh -huh. My other life before I decided to be a music teacher was I wanted to be a dairy farmer. I still have family that runs dairy farms, uh -huh. and uh, we have... One milk cow, and we have her calf, and uh, mm -hmm. we usually have a couple steers. Well, how about that? That's terrific. Keeps me sane. Well, yeah, you're kind of a many-faceted individual. Uh, not what we call a renaissance man, but you certainly do incorporate a lot of the, the good things in life into your life. Well, life, life, life's a pretty fun thing. And, uh, yeah. You know, I, don't wanna, I have to entertain myself somehow sometimes. <laughs> so. Sometimes it's cows, sometimes it's sheep, sometimes yeah. it's... Well, you know, uh, I, love my, I love my job. I'm sure that raising sheep is very entertaining. <laughs> That's a small, it's a lot. The, our girls love to be out there right now because we have these little lambs. and oh, yeah, They're very they, cuddly. and mm -hmm. They learn the life and death and birth cycle that way, do too. Do they ever. We, it's been really neat for them to be connected to that. Uh -huh. Well, it's been wonderful chatting with you, uh, Ken. Nice chatting with you. But I'm getting this message that just came in. We're out of here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> They're throwing us out. So I want to thank you for joining us. Will you come back again? It would be my pleasure. Uh, when you win the next year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure to let you know. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's just an incredible thing, and I, I, I want to thank you for giving us a little of your time and insight into your thoughts about education and music. And, uh, You're very welcome. If you, um, if you will come back, I'd appreciate it very much. We'll have a lot of fun. It's a deal. And we can talk more about the sheep, I think. And the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Want me to bring one of them in? I could. You so. could, yeah. We, we've had more uh, Stranger Things here before. All right. We had a whole menagerie of dogs one time. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, sheep would be different. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for joining us. And I want to say uh, to everybody out there, um, have a wonderful uh, have a wonderful week next week. And may all that is proud and true and noble abide with you.
I'm Reed Powers.